a blood-soaked battleground, a historic lighthouse, and a popular university await on this list of some of the most haunted places in North Carolina. Let's get rolling. Hey guys, and thanks for joining me for this exploration into some of the most haunted places in the Tar Heel State or North Carolina. From historic towns to dense woodlands to the Great Smoky Mountains themselves, North Carolina is a beautiful yet mysterious region packed with classic southern ghost stories and old hill folklore sure to send shivers down your spine. So without further delay, let's start this spooky little adventure. Located right in the center of the state, our first haunt has us exploring the infamous Bentonville Battlefield. Located off of 5466 Harper House Road in Johnston County, the Bentonville Battlefield is a state historic landmark preserving the site of the 1865 Battle of Bentonville, which transpired through the latter portion of the American Civil War as the largest of such battles to take place in North Carolina, and whose blood-soaked grounds have long been surrounded by chilling tales of the otherworldly. Historically, following his march to the sea, Major General William T. Sherman, who headed the military division of the Mississippi, would order his forces northward into the Carolinas. Though Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant would order Sherman to march his soldiers to Virginia instead to face the Army of North Virginia, Sherman reasoned this would take far too long and opted to cut Confederate supply lines to Petersburg instead, after which, on March 13th of 1865, he would divide his command into two parts, being the Army of Georgia and the Army of Tennessee, and would march these wings separately towards Goldsboro, expecting little resistance from Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston's Army of Tennessee. Little did he know how However, Johnston would manage to concentrate the Army of Tennessee, a division of the Army of Northern Virginia, and troops from the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida into a combined force that he called the Army of the South, and would take advantage of Sherman's preemptively split wings in order to attempt to destroy the Army of Georgia first, following which the remaining Army of Tennessee would be much less of a threat. The Army of the South would launch their attack on March 19th of 1865. To the shock of Sherman, Confederate forces would fight with the Noose River to their rear, and expecting only small cavalry instead of an entire army, Union forces were taken heavily by surprise. Though the Confederates would put up a stalwart fight, the battle would ultimately end on March 21st of the same year in a Union victory when Johnston pulled his forces back across Mill Creek Bridge, burning the crossing in his wake. When all was said and done, it was documented that Confederate forces sustained 2,600 casualties with 239 killed, 1,694 wounded, and 673 missing, while Union forces only sustained 1,527 casualties with 194 killed, 1,100 112 wounded and 221 missing. Following the fight, the battlefield would be preserved. In 1965, a park was completed around it with a visitor's center founded, and in 1996, the site was declared a National Historic Landmark. Not at all surprisingly, the whole of the Bentonville battlefield is rumored to be haunted by the restless spirits of those lost to the chaos, and both officials and visitors to its bounds have reported phantom gun and cannon fire, the clash of small arms, and disembodied cries and shouts that echo across the empty expanse. Following the conflict, the Harper House, which is located within the park, was used as a makeshift trauma ward where the injured were treated, and a mass grave that sits just adjacent contains the remains of around 360 Confederate soldiers. Right near this weathered abode, many have described extreme cold spots, instances of objects moving around on their own, and both mysterious boot steps and boot prints left in fresh mud. Additionally, the apparitions of both John Harper, who lent his house out following the battle, and of a mysterious girl who it's believed was claimed by TB have been reported lurking around the area. Also documented across the battlefield are orbs visible to the naked eye, encounters with shadowy figures that stalk lone walkers, and entire phantom scenes of battle in which visitors have sighted soldiers locked in combat in what they believe to be reenactments, only to watch said scenes fade away into nothingness. Okay, so our second haunt lands us just off of the coast of North Carolina at the picturesque Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, which is located in the outer banks of Hatteras Island, out of the town of Buxton, North Carolina, is a prominent landmark acting as part of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore that's widely considered one of the most beautiful and famous of all light towers in the United States, as well as one of its most haunted. 
Historically, on July 10th of 1794, Alexander Hamilton himself would request a navigational marker on the point after his ship literally almost crashed and sunk on its way to the New World, earning the site's first tower, which was completed by 1802, the nickname of Hamilton's Light. Through the Civil War, the Lighthouse Board would request protection of the Cape Hatteras Light. However, sadly, by 1862, it was reported that both the lens and lantern were destroyed and the tower sustained heavy damages. In 1868, and by request of the United States Lighthouse Board, a second beacon at Cape Hatteras was constructed by 1870 and at 200 feet in height, boasted the title of being the tallest tower in the world at the time. And in February of 1871, the first tower was demolished entirely, resulting in ruins that lasted until their erosion amidst a particularly brutal storm in 1980. Unfortunately, from the time of the second tower's completion, sea erosion would result in a raising of the coastline, and in 1935, it would be replaced temporarily by an aero beacon atop a four-legged steel tower, after which the second tower was acquired by the National Park Service. And in 1942, when German U-boats began literally attacking ships right off the shoreline, the Coast Guard would resume control of this second tower until 1945 as a lookout, following which, in an unexpected turn, accretion of the sand on the beach would actually enable this tower to once again act as a navigational aid. More recently, in 1999, the sea would begin to encroach on the tower once again, and our second construct was actually relocated from its original location up to safer grounds atop a sand dune. The Cape Hatteras Lighthouse remains in use as a navigational aid to this day, and has since grown into a massive tourist attraction. Of the folklore and many ghost stories surrounding this light, perhaps none is more perplexing than the tragic tale of the ship, the Carol A. Deering. In January of 1921, the Deering set sail from Barbados, after which several vessels actually reported sighting her sailing en route to her destination with seemingly no issues. However, on January 31st, she was discovered amidst a storm grounded just off of the Cape Hatteras coastline in an area recognized as the Atlantic Graveyard. Following the passage of said storm, investigations of the vessel would yield it completely devoid of life, with all of its lifeboats missing and strangely a large, untouched meal set across her tables. To this day, and though there are theories, no one really knows what happened to the Deering's crew, but her phantom likeness has been spied right near the light, especially on stormy nights. Another popular story surrounding technically not just the lighthouse, but the whole of Cape Hatteras tells of the region's iconic Grey Man. Now this entity, or being, or whatever, is known to manifest right before the start of heavy storms, and though his appearance can be quite startling, locals hold a special fondness for the Grey Man, in that he literally warns them of impending danger and has possibly even resulted in countless lives saved. Lastly, within the light tower itself, some have told of disembodied voices and bootsteps, phantom tobacco smoke, and of objects found inexplicably rearranged, all phenomena which are believed to be related to the spirits of former light keepers, and a ghostly black and white cat has been known to approach or even rub up against visitors, only to disappear the moment they attempt to either pet or pick it up. Our third haunt takes us to North Carolina's largest city, to the Queen's University of Charlotte. Queen's University, which is located in Charlotte, North Carolina, is a private institution affiliated with the Presbyterian Church that offers 34 undergrad majors, 66 concentrations, and 10 grad programs, and that, over its extensive existence, has acted as a birthing grounds to a number of eerie campus legends and terrifying ghost stories. Historically, Queen's University was first founded in 1857 as the Charlotte Female Institute and was originally located off of College and 9th Street in what is now Uptown Charlotte. In 1930, it would merge itself with Shakora College for Women, which was initially established out of Columbia, South Carolina, after which Shakora would sell off all of its assets and donate the proceeds to Queen's College, which in turn would retain Shakora's student and alumni records. And from 1930 to 1939, the merged institute would be called the Queen's Chikora College. Through the 1940s, Queens College would take steps to adopt a co-educational curriculum. Shortly after World War II, men were allowed to attend on site, though on a limited basis, and in 1948, Queens would establish a fully co-ed evening school. Much more recently, however, in 1987, the institution would finally officialize itself as fully co-educational, and in 2002, the campus would shed its secondary moniker in favor of re-establishing itself as the Queens University of Charlotte that we know today. 
Like many of the other colleges we've covered in the past, Queens is no stranger to campus ghost stories and classic urban legends, and both students and faculty have reported a wide range of supernatural encounters, including shadowy figures that stalk lone walkers at night, strange fogs that descend upon certain areas alone even on otherwise clear days, and old-timey music heard drifting on the winds without source. One more popular campus fable surrounds Morrison Hall and involves a former student named Clara. According to this tale, Clara lived lived in one of the upstairs bedrooms in the hall and was seeing a boy who was called away to serve through World War II. While her beau was absent, however, Clara held relations with another man, and though she would attempt to write the soldier in order to break things off, he ended up getting sent home before her letter could ever reach him, and made a trip to the school in order to surprise Clara, only to find her spending time with her new paramour. Now, this is where things get a bit fuzzy. Some say the soldier tied a bedsheet around Clara's neck, while others that the young, grief-stricken girl decided to take her own life in the same manner. But whatever the case, her body was found swinging from the backstair banister the next morning, and to date, ceiling to floor slats block access to this banister, likely for this very reason. Incidentally, Clara's ghost has been known to move personal effects, mess with both faculty and students' computers, and play small pranks on the living. And time and time again, this mischievous manifestation has caused frames hanging on the walls to shift or fall off entirely. Another famous story associates itself to what is now known as Queen's Hall, or formerly Burwell Hall. Wife of Reverend Robert Burwell, one Margaret Anna Burwell was actually the university's first matron and the heart and soul of what was, from 1857 to 1872, the Charlotte Female Institute. Legend has it that Lady Burwell's spirit still lingers on the campus she so loved in life, and many have reported catching a long black dress swish swiftly past out of the peripheral, as well as encounters with her full-bodied entity, usually after dark. In the Albright Residence Hall through the 1800s, it's documented that one young student slit her own wrists, possibly following her family's discovery of a relationship she was having with another woman called Julie. Chillingly, within Albright, doors have been known to open and slam shut on their own, strange knocking sounds are often heard from somewhere just out of sight, and unbelievably, the name Julie often appears on various walls, sometimes written in blood. In the Wallace Residence Hall, many have told of odd banging noises and cold spots. In the Suzanne little rehearsal hall, some have told of a well-dressed female apparition, possibly that of Suzanne, and of the piano playing on its own. All across campus, the ghosts of Civil War soldiers have been spied marching about briefly before disappearing, and in the Belk Residence Hall, one student described her bed and other furniture vibrating and moving, the room trapping her inside, and of an eerie, pale female entity that's been reported numerous times as peeking out of the same closet door. Lastly, a disturbing story from Hall Brown's Room 303 tells of a young girl who woke in the middle of the night to see her roommate slumped terrifyingly over a desk. Frantically, she tried to wake the young girl before realizing her roommate was actually still in bed. Slowly, this figure in question raised her head and stared straight into the student's eyes before fading away. And on to our fourth haunt, which is placed in North Carolina's most famous beach town at the Bellamy Mansion. The Bellamy Mansion, which is based out of Wilmington, North Carolina, is an iconic construct fashioned in neoclassical architectural styles including Greek Revival and Italianet that stands as one of the state's finest examples of antebellum architecture and that's shrouded in a slew of chilling ghost stories and Old Hill folklore. Historically, by 1860, Wilmington was both the largest city in North Carolina and also a leader in the naval stores industry on a global level, resulting in a number of prominent citizens, including plantation owner, physician, and entrepreneur Dr. John D. Bellamy, setting up shop in the locale. With the help of architect James F. Post, Bellamy would construct his 22-room Greek Revival-style mansion from 1859 to 1860, and a year later, in 1861, he would move into the abode with his wife of 22 years. Eliza, their eight children, and one unborn child which Eliza was carrying at the time. Of John's four daughters, only one, Mary Elizabeth, would actually marry and have children, with Liza and Ellen living out their days unmarried in the family mansion, while Kate, who had predated the construction of the mansion, had passed on as an infant in 1858. An avid slaving plantation, following the end of the Civil War, the Bellamy's properties were seized by the federal government, and while Dr. John would attempt to reclaim his family home, one General Holly would ensure he was actually not even permitted to come back to Wilmington. Following a failed negotiation between Holly's wife Harriet and Mrs. Bellamy, John would seek pardon to reclaim his land, and though he would eventually unfortunately acquire said pardon, the home would remain under the control of Union forces for a time. 
Following their reclamation of the land, in 1870, Mrs. Bellamy and their daughter, Ellen, would plot out plans for an expansive garden enclosed in a black iron fence. And through the remainder of the 19th century, John would return to practicing medicine and the couple would live out their days as successful businessmen, farmers, politicians, doctors, and homemakers. In 1896, Dr. John would pass on. In 1907, Eliza would join her husband in death, and the home would be acquired by daughters Liza and Ellen, who would also meet their fates in 1929 and 1946, respectively. More recently, in February of 1972, fourth-generation Bellamy's would form the Bellamy Mansion Incorporated in hopes of preserving the site. However, only a month later, arsonists would set fire to the expanse, resulting in the need for sweeping renovations. Through the rest of the 70s, and 80s, Bellamy Mansion Inc. would work on a set of complete restorations. In 1989, the property was donated to the Historic Preservation Foundation of North Carolina, and in 1994, the Bellamy Mansion Museum of History and Design Arts was officially opened. In 2001, the former carriage house was transformed into a visitor center for the museum, and in 2014, the former slave quarters was fully restored to depict conditions experienced by those unfortunate enough to be enslaved on site. The mansion remains open to visitors to this day, offering tours from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. from Tuesday through Saturday, and from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Sundays. Fitting the bill as a classic haunted mansion, the old Bellamy property is no stranger to stories of the supernatural, with officials, volunteers, and visitors reporting a wide assortment of inexplicable activity, including doors that open and close on their own, extreme cold spots felt in adverse weather, and disembodied bootsteps heard emanating from empty spaces. The top floor of the mansion, or the children's floor, is perhaps the most notable conduit for inexplicable activity, and those who have braved this space have reported objects moving around on their own, the phantom sounds of kids giggling or playing about, and fleeting sightings of small forms that dart around corners only to quickly disappear or walk straight through solid walls. Also reported throughout the mansion and confined to no area in particular are encounters with shadowy figures, strange images that appear in mirrors and other reflective surfaces, and the constant feelings of being watched, followed, or touched by someone or something unseen. And several paranormal investigations have yielded high EMF levels and crystal clear EVPs. While stories of run-ins with the ghosts of various Bellamy's, including Dr. John himself, have been reported, perhaps none are more commonly encountered than that of the aforementioned Ellen Douglas Bellamy, with these accounts based off of her fondness for reading newspapers before bed. Incidentally, in life, the black ink from the papers would rub off onto Ellen's fingers, after which she would almost habitually leave smudge marks on the sconces while turning out the lights. Strangely, smudge marks still reappear to this day, despite repeated cleanings or even total repaintings. Lastly, during some filming taking place at the Bellamy Mansion in 1990, the film crew reported that after locking the front door mid-shoot, they heard the sound of it fly open and slam shut again with a loud bang, after which a cold blast of air rushed past them and up through the library, where the door there also flew open and slammed shut. There was then a loud pounding noise on the library door, and the crew was so spooked they actually decided to immediately vacate the property. Our fifth and final haunt has us touring the former house of the prestigious Vanderbilt family, the Biltmore Estate. The Biltmore Estate, which is based in Asheville, North Carolina, is a historic house museum and popular tourist attraction spanning 178,926 square feet that boasts the title of being the largest privately owned house in the whole of the country, and that's been tied to a number of spine-tingling ghost stories and tales of supernatural phenomena. Historically, through the 1880s and at the height of the Gilded Age, George Washington Vanderbilt II would begin visiting the Asheville region with his mother, Maria Louisa Kassem Vanderbilt, and would quickly fall in love with the locale, leading to his decision to construct Biltmore as what he deemed his little mountain escape. Construction of the house would begin in 1889 and would entail the addition of an on-site brick kiln, a woodworking factory, and a workforce of over 1,000. During its construction, Vanderbilt would make numerous trips across the globe to acquire rare antiquities and furniture for this new estate, and through Christmas of 1895, he would open the expanse to a massive housewarming party. Over the years, Biltmore would welcome a host of notable guests from novelists to ambassadors to U.S. presidents. In 1898, George would marry one Edith Stuyvesant Dresser, and in 1900, the couple would welcome their only child, a daughter named Cornelia, into the world right at Biltmore. In the Lewis 
purchased the 15th room. Unfortunately, financing of the estate was extensive, resulting in Vanderbilt selling off 87,000 acres of the surrounding land. In 1914, George would pass on due to complications of an appendectomy, and overwhelmed, his widow Edith would first sell Biltmore Estate Industries and later Biltmore Village in 1917 and 1921 respectively. Following the marriage of Cornelia to one John Francis Amherst Cecil in April of 1924, the couple would occupy the estate and would welcome two sons into the world in the exact same room as their mother before them. Through the Great Depression, Cornelia and John would open their family home to the public in March of 1930 in hopes of bolstering tourism and financing of its lands. In 1934, the Cecils would divorce. Through World War II, the property would close for a time. In 1942, 62 paintings and 176 sculptures would be transferred from the National Gallery of Art in D.C. to Biltmore for safekeeping. And in 1954, John Cecil would pass on from his residence in the Bachelor's Wing, after which Vanderbilt Cecil's son George Henry would remain on site until 1956, when the estate ceased to act as a family home and was transformed into a house museum instead. Later through the 50s, younger Vanderbilt Cecil's son William Amherst would return to the mansion with George Henry, where they would attempt to soldier through their family's financial troubles. In 1963, the site would be listed as a National Historic Landmark. Following the death of Cornelia in 1976, the brothers would inherit different portions of Biltmore, and in 1995, while celebrating the estate's centennial Tenerary, William would turn control of the company over to his son, William A. V. Cecil Jr. Since the death of the senior William Amherst Vanderbilt Cecil in October of 2017, his widow, Mimi Cecil, and their daughter, Denny Pickering, would begin acting as board members, while their son, Bill Cecil, would act as a chief executive officer of the company. Biltmore remains a prominent tourist attraction to this day, and totes an astounding assessed value of $157.2 million. As far as documentation of ghostly activity on site goes, Biltmore boasts no shortage of mysterious tales and Old Hill folklore, and both officials and visitors to its bounds have reported a range of spooky happenings, including extreme cold spots, the smells of tobacco or food without source, and instances of eerie feelings experienced or apparitions sighted near or ascending or descending the stairs. One of the most common phenomenon on site is that of a disembodied voice that calls out, George, and many believe the spirit of Edith lurks about, forever seeking the comfort of her beloved husband. Incidentally, the full-bodied apparitions of both George and Edith have been spied roaming various hallways, though sadly, they're almost never seen together and always seem to be searching for one another. Also reported throughout Biltmore, the phantom sounds of laughter, of glasses clinking, of old-timey music, and of light-hearted chatter, as if the souls of those who once graced its bounds are still enjoying a party long lost to time and from the other side. A more infamous haunted location on a state ground is the old forestry compound in which, long ago, a working girl was murdered and several were hanged to death. The spirits of this young woman and of the aforementioned executed have been sighted roaming about the area. However, several have reported watching them disappear as they attempt to exit this small portion of the property. Both informal and formal investigations of the property have yielded strange EVPs, high EMF levels, and hits on spirit grids, while others have told of disembodied bootsteps and of strange gusts of wind that pick up within rooms that are completely sealed off. Lastly, and possibly most strangely, while it's unknown if the Vanderbilts were pet people or not, or if this phenomenon is linked to someone else or something else entirely, the ghost of a headless orange cat has been known to approach visitors throughout the garden. In consideration of its astounding range of paranormal activity and its fascinating history, the Biltmore Estate stands as a grand testament to both the passage of time and North Carolinian folklore as a whole, and invites those brave enough to explore its bounds into a world where the lines between the living and the dead are just a little bit thinner. Thanks for joining me in exploring some of the most haunted places in North Carolina. If you enjoyed hearing my histories and ghost stories, subscribe to my channel, like this upload, and share me with anyone you feel could use a good scare. I'll catch you all next time.